This hearing will come to order. Before we begin, I'd like to ask unanimous consent from the committee, the gentleman from California, and former member of this committee, Mr. McNerney, be allowed to join us at the dais today and participate in today's proceedings. Hearing no objections, so ordered. Mr. Secretary, welcome uh, to uh, the committee. I appreciate, sincerely appreciate you being here on uh, relatively short notice. Uh, and, and we're here today to understand how veterans are being impacted by the lapse in appropriations uh, that has the government uh, currently in a shutdown mode. Uh, there's plenty of blame uh, that can be shared uh, as to why we're in this position, but that's not why uh, I, I called the hearing. I really called the hearing so that we can get the best possible information uh, available uh, out to the veteran community. Uh, veterans want to know whether their disability checks and VI bill, uh, bill benefits uh, will be paid in November uh, and thereafter. Uh, they want to know if their disability claims will be decided or further delayed. Families want to know if their loved ones will receive a timely burial at VA national cemeteries. And many of VA's employees themselves uh, want to know whether they'll be serving veterans on the job or whether they're uh, going to be furloughed. I understand that answers to some of these questions are entirely dependent on how long uh, the shutdown uh, lasts. And although I want to be uh, sure that most of us agree that we want the shutdown over quickly, it's our responsibility to ensure uh, that the public, especially veterans, understand what the current state of play is. First of all, Mr. Secretary, I want to say that in the last couple of weeks, uh, getting good information about your contingency plans and the effect of uh, lapse and appropriations and its effect on veterans has been very difficult uh, for us to get the information uh, out of your office. For example, uh, the original field guide that VA put out regarding the shutdown impact at first spoke of no effect, no effect on payments to veterans or processing of their benefits. But in a later version, VA stated that a prolonged shutdown would impact both, but didn't provide any details uh, as to how it would be impacted. Secondly, the Veterans Health Administration is not shut down at all because it has received a full year's appropriation for 2014 back in March. So hospitals, clinics, and vet centers should all be open for business. Yet the president made a statement the day before the shutdown saying that veterans will find their support centers unstaffed and implied that counseling services for veterans with PTS would be affected. Third, this committee has consistently been told by VBA's mandatory overtime effort towards the backlog would actually end on September 30th. Yet days into the shutdown, we're now informed that the shutdown prevented VA's planned continued payment of overtime. Fourth, although a shutdown should have a relatively uniform effect across all regional offices, as suggested by your own field guide, my staff met with several representatives from VSO's last week who relayed that their members are hearing mixed messages out of different regional offices. And I think it goes without saying none of this uh, is ideal. Some degree of confusion is to be expected, and we understand that. But VA employees should be worrying about VA's mission of service to veterans, not planning for furloughs or managing an agency on spare change remaining from last year. However, what can never be expected is anything less than the full truth, as best as it is known at the time. This grave situation does not need to be assisted by misleading statements from anybody, statements designed to aid a political argument by any political party, regardless of which one we may belong to. It's my hope that we can uphold the best traditions of this committee and rise above all of that today. Mr. Secretary, I appreciate your willingness to join us uh, in this effort. 
Since this hearing was called last Friday, we've had a little bit more clarity on some of the issues we've been asking your staff about for the last 10 days. But I thought the public should hear some of the same information. Now, one last point before I conclude. Last July, we held a hearing on a bill that the ranking member and I introduced that proposed to advance fund the entire VA discretionary budget. The administration declined to take a position on the bill, saying instead it needed to conduct a review first. It's obvious that no review is necessary given where we are today. Mr. Secretary, I sincerely hope that you are making that case with the administration. And I'll follow up with you on that point during questioning. And I now recognize the ranking member, Mr. Michaud, for his opening statement. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, for having this uh, hearing today. And I want to thank you, Mr. Secretary, for coming. Uh, before we begin exploring how the government shutdown is affecting veterans and the VA, I want to acknowledge that the very real consequences and the lapse in appropriation has had on VA employees. I know that VA employees do not work solely for a paycheck. They work because they believe in helping veterans. A lot of them are veterans. And you, they have done a, a phenomenal job, and now it's time for Congress uh, to do its job. We can do this in two ways. Number one, either the Senate take up the Milcon VA appropriation bill that was passed by the House about four months ago, or the House can take up a clean CR passed by the Senate. I don't care which one that we choose as long as we get on with the reopening of government and that we fully fund VA. The VA contingency plan and field guide provide us with a rough idea of the consequences of a government shutdown. Last week, we saw the immediate uh, shutdown, what it had on some of VA offices, such as the Inspector General. Yesterday, we saw some VBA and IT accounts run dry and thousands of VA employees furloughed. We know that the mandatory funds to pay compensation and pension benefits are scheduled to run out in a little over two weeks. We also know that furloughs and suspensions of programs and other agencies also affect veterans. Of the roughly 2.1 million federal employees, more than 600,000 are veterans. Many of them are already or expect to be furloughed. Also, as programs and services at other agencies are disrupted, it affects VA's ability to receive the necessary information and support to deliver those services for our veterans. We know we'll hear bad news today from you, Mr. Secretary. Important VA operations have or will be suspended. Some veterans will not get what they are expecting, what they deserve, and most importantly, what they have earned. This may be a difficult conversation, but one that we must have openly, frankly, and honestly. But amidst the bad news, there is some good news. With VA's medical accounts under advance appropriation, the Veterans Health Administration is largely unaffected by lapse in the fiscal year 2014 appropriation. All medical facilities are open, as you heard from the chairman, and operation under normal status. This will, will, will continue regardless how long the current government is shut down. It is clear now that in the midst of the shutdown, that getting a vote on H.R. 813 as amended, the Putting the Veterans Funding First Act, is necessary and a critical step in ensuring veterans' benefits and services are not put at risk when the, there is a lapse in appropriation. And Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for signing on the letter with me uh, to the Speaker asking that H.R. 813 as amended be scheduled for floor action. I encourage all members of the committee to sign on to that letter and to send a message that veterans should not and cannot and will not be disadvantaged by uh, party politics in the future, regardless of which party is in control. Mr. Secretary, I look forward to your testimony and uh, in the questions uh, to follow. And Mr. Chairman, once again, I want to thank you very much for having this uh, very important and timely hearing 
uh, today. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Michaud. Thank you to all the members for your attendance today. Uh, as you might uh, imagine, this is a, a critical time uh, within our government and certainly for our veterans uh, out there. And that's why I asked the secretary, and I am so pleased that on very short notice, uh, he was able to come in and give us uh, some indication of where we are now uh, within the VA and where we will be going in the future, depending on how long uh, this shutdown does, in fact, continue. I want to welcome to the table our first and only witness of this morning, the uh, Honorable Eric Shinseki, Secretary for the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. Your complete written statement, Mr. Secretary, will be entered uh, into the record, and you are recognized now for five minutes. Great. Uh, Chairman Miller, Ranking Member Michelle, members of the committee, uh, thank you for uh, entering my written statement. Uh, let me, uh, Mr. Chairman, just uh, recognize uh, uh, in the room here, we have uh, partners uh, for all of us from our veteran service organizations. Uh, I would tell you they've been uh, quite directly helpful to me over the past four and a half years um, and trying to help us understand how to be better at our responsibilities of caring for veterans, uh, but also service members and families and survivors uh, that uh, we are responsible for. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you called this hearing to examine the effect of uh, government shutdown on VA benefits and services to veterans. And while my written testimony describes many effects on DA, uh, VA due to the ongoing lapse in appropriations, uh, let me just say unequivocally that all the effects that I described and I'm going to describe uh, of the shutdown are negative. It is an impediment to VA's ability to deliver services and benefits that veterans have earned through their service. VA continues to invest significant resources and time and planning for this unique, uh, infrequent, and avoidable situation. The ongoing shutdown presents myriad legal and programmatic challenges. The last time a shutdown occurred in 1996, as I am told, our nation was enjoying a sustained period of relative peace. That's not true today. Today, we're in the 13th year of the war in Afghanistan, providing care and benefits to veterans of that war and the war in Iraq as well. Members of this latest generation of veterans are enrolling in VA at a higher rate than ever before. They, along with the veterans of every preceding generation, will be harmed if the shutdown continues. In brief, in the last six months through 30 September, the Veterans Benefits Administration, VBA, reduced the backlog of compensation claims, something we've all been working on and, and prodding and encouraging them to do better. Well, they've uh, begun that delivery. 193,000 claims in the backlog reduced in the last 190 days, roughly 190 days, a 31.5% increase in about uh, a little over six months. Uh, since the shutdown began on 1 October, the backlog uh, has stalled and, in fact, has increased by about 2,000 claims. Uh, VBA has already furloughed more than 7,800 of its employees, half of whom are veterans. The shutdown directly threatens VA's ability to eliminate the backlog. We've lost ground. We fought hard to take. Roughly 1,400 veterans a day are now not receiving decisions on their disability compensation claims due to the end of overtime. If the shutdown does not end in the coming weeks, VA will not be able to assure delivery of one November checks to more than 5.18 million beneficiaries, and that accounts for about $6.25 billion in payments that people are expecting, and compensation, and pensions, and dependents, and indemnity compensation, DIC, fiduciary, educational, vocational rehabilitation, and employment uh, benefits, including veterans who are 100% disabled, surviving spouses, eligible, ch eligible children, orphaned by the death of their military or veteran parent, tuition and stipends for over 500,000 veteran service members and eligible family members in education programs will also stop. These are some of the major issues veterans face if the shutdown continues. My written testimony includes details of other negative impacts to our IT initiatives, to our National Cemetery Administration, whose employees lay to honored rest those who have served this nation, to VA staff offices, and to VA employees themselves, especially 
those who are veterans. While some have suggested a series of many continuing resolutions of many CRs, if you will, as an approach to meeting our FY 2014 budgetary uh, responsibilities for funding the government, uh, that's not a solution uh, for veterans or for our nation. The budget request submitted by President Obama nearly six months ago was a result of an extensive, cooperative, synchronized effort across all departments and agencies to produce a budget request that coherently balanced priorities and risks. Picking and choosing parts of government to fund would ignore two key drumbeats that I've tried to deliver over the past four and a half years. The first is that very little of what we work on in VA originates in VA. Uh, much of that originates in another department. And then second, VA's care for veterans, and by that I mean health care, education, employment, insurance, housing, for both the homeowner and the homeless, does not occur without significant coordination with DOD, with Housing and Urban Development, HHS, Social Security, Treasury, Education, Labor, the IRS, Small Business Administration. And frankly, it is this collaboration amongst and across the government that allows us uh, to be uh, effective. And I would add to that, we have a fourth mission, I think, as the chairman uh, uh, recalls, besides our three administration, uh, we have a fourth mission in the event of emergency, national disaster, humanitarian requirements that I must make available uh, our capabilities uh, where it is needed. And so our work with FEMA and uh, uh, DHS, Homeland Security, is also part of our day-to-day -day responsibilities. These are not insignificant connections for this department. Without them, we are less effective in serving veterans, our service members, their families, and our survivors. And so these are the facts that I uh, present, Mr. Chairman. At a critical time for veterans, everyone at VA, as you said, should be focusing on how best to accomplish their missions. And so I ask the committee and the rest of Congress to help us by resolving this fiscal impasse now so that VA and our federal partners on whom we have to rely to do our work can get back to work full time, fulfilling President Lincoln's call to care for those who are born to battle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. You and I both know that regular order uh, is not in the mode that we're in today, but regular order, in fact, requires a piecemeal approach of 12 appropriation bills. 126 plus days ago, this House, on a bipartisan basis, passed a VA military construction bill that fully funded, not just partially funded on a short-term basis, which is what folks are asking for now, is just a, a part of a CR, fully funded. Yet that bill languishes uh, over in the Senate. To my colleagues who may not recall because it's been so long that we sent that bill over to the Senate, there's very little difference, maybe a quarter of a percent difference between the two bills. It could very easily be brought forward and this would be off the table. And so my, my question is, in, in statement is in years past, uh, House and Senate, regardless of parties and the, the White House, have always come together and tried to find a way to prioritize uh, how money would be spent, who would be at the top of the list as we started to, to shut the government down and, and run out of money. Uh, and, and today, we, we don't have that. Uh, even back in the shutdown of 1995, uh, there was a prioritization, uh, and DOD and veterans were taken off the table. Uh, of which they're not right now. So my question, Mr. Secretary, is is don't you think VA benefits certainly should get the same priority or prioritization today as it has in other shutdown situations? I missed the last piece of your question, Mr. Chairman, in some priorities. Just basically in, in years in years past we have, in fact, prioritized spending needs. DOD and VA has always been basically taken off the table. Uh, and my question is, what's different this time? Uh, and don't you think veterans' benefits, uh, in fact, should be prioritized at a higher level than others within our federal government? 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would uh, just tell you this department has benefited uh, from uh, leadership of the president and the uh, leadership and support in the Congress. Uh, if you look at what has transpired over the last four years to our budgets, I think we can all be proud of uh, what we have done to take care of veterans. And I will always tell you that uh, that's a top priority with me. Uh, but I do understand that there is a budget uh, request presented uh, to the Congress. Uh, there is a process that you refer to that requires a passage of a budget. And within that, the um, individual departments uh, are, are then uh, provided a guidance on what their budgets will be. I'm not sure where uh, the Congress is in that process, uh, but I would ask the Congress uh, to provide us a budget. Uh, so that not only this department, but our partners in government on whom we rely to do our mission uh, well uh, can get on with business. I think it's important to, to discuss the differences between a budget and an appropriation because it has been conflated in the national media uh, that because a budget hasn't been passed, we can't appropriate money. In fact, we've done it for a number of years now because we haven't been able to come to an agreement on a, on a budget. We did pass in this House over 126 days ago now by a large bipartisan measure, and I would hope you would know or have some type of an idea of why the Senate is holding that so tight, has chosen not to move that legislation forward. We've passed four different full appropriation bills, and, and I'm hoping that maybe you can help me understand why the Senate continues not to act on the full not a piecemeal, partial bill, but a whole funding bill. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I appreciate your confidence and my ability to uh, sort through this for the Congress. Uh, I would just claim to be just an average guy trying to do a job here. But here's what I'm facing. I didn't know there was going to be a shutdown. I had no idea that this was uh, intended uh, to happen. And so uh, the month of uh, September is, uh, for me, the end of a fiscal year. What usually happens is I'm trying to get people to tell me how they finished what I instructed them to do throughout the year with the funds that the Congress has uh, provided, generously provided, and, uh, and then anticipate that I will have a budget on 1 October in which to understand how to make that transition. Um, because these transitions uh, in the past have been difficult, Congress authorizes uh, a carryover opportunity, uh, but it limits what I can carry over. And so in one department, uh, one uh, administration, it may be as low as 4%. In another, it may go as high as 10%. But these are uh, limitations. Uh, I need to understand what we are doing to close out properly so I know what our carryover is going to be so that I can understand that we're uh, meeting Congress's intent and then expecting that I'm going to have a budget in which to dovetail these activities into. And it usually takes me about 10 days at the end of a, a fiscal year to be able to bring this to order. So about today is when I would have these factors coming together and uh, in fact this week would have been the week that I uh, would have my FY14 execution meetings with the various uh, accounts. Um, I would just tell you these factors are coming together daily and there are adjustments here uh, in how much money is available and, uh, and the burn rate at which uh, those funds will last. Uh, and so uh, we're doing the best we can. Uh, two things we're doing here. We're trying to keep our operations going for as long as possible to where we are allowed by exception under the law to take care of as many veterans as we can for as long as possible. The other thing I have to do is make sure I'm taking care of our employees so that I'm not telling people that they're going to be furloughed when in fact they aren't going to be. So there is a period of time here not to be alarmist. But at an appropriate moment when we know we're going to have to, we're not going to have a budget, we're going to have to take uh, other uh, steps uh, that we will uh, inform uh, our employees that they are going to be furloughed. The ones that have been furloughed, we've gone through this process. But it's not just telling them you're furloughed, close the door, and leave. Uh, we're going to get a budget here at some point, Mr. Chairman. And what I want 
our offices to be able to do is come back and as soon as uh, capable be up and running at, at uh, full speed. And that requires us to close out in an orderly function. If I would, you know, forgive me, I'll fall back to my old military experience. You know, at the end of the day, I want everyone in a fighting position to organize for whatever might happen that night. Grenades in one location, rifles oriented in the right direction, left and right, aiming stakes, ammunition, water, and be prepared. I want us to be in the same position that when we have a budget, people go back to work and we're up at full speed, so we're taking care of veterans uh, as quickly as we can. I don't want to spend 30 days trying to figure out how we get back to that uh, point. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Mr. Michaud. Thank you, Mr. S Secretary, and uh, I can understand why you can't predict what the Senate will do or, or the House do as far as that goes. But as I mentioned in my opening statement, there are two areas we can solve this. One, the Senate can pass the full appropriation bill that we passed uh, about four months ago uh, to fund all of VA. <clears throat> or the House can pass a clean Senate CR that will get us, unfortunately it's a, still a CR, but it will still move us to, uh, beyond this particular point. And I understand your um, uh, that even with the full MILCON VA appropriation bill, there are still services that veterans will not be able to receive because other parts of the federal government are not up and operating because of the shutdown, and I totally understand that, uh, but it's my hope that the bulk of the VA could be taken care of. Uh, my question to you, Mr. Secretary, you had mentioned uh, uh, trying to get the staff back up and running once the, the shutdown is, is done. Uh, if say today that Congress and the President was able to get uh, you know, our act together, how long will it take the VA to get up and running full steam ahead and when will you be able to uh, assess some of the damages, particularly as it relates to the backlog that it will take to try to get back on track again? Yeah. Uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, Congressman, uh, at this point, uh, you know, in some sections, hours, today's and other, others, uh, other sections. Uh, but the longer we go, uh, then, the, then the startup will you know, just take longer. Uh, fact is, um, you know, I've indicated that on 1 November, I uh, will not be able to pay uh, all these uh, beneficiaries who are expecting uh, those checks. Uh, I, I need uh, the authorization, appropriations, and a budget to be able to do that. And I, I don't do that independently. Uh, in order to make those claims decisions, I link into IRS and Social Security, education with the Department of Education, small business. So uh, I would say that what is best for veterans and for all of us right now is a uh, you know, budget for the entire uh, federal government. Let us get back to work. The sooner we do it, the faster I get back up to full speed. Uh, we, we did uh, a couple of years ago a past uh, advanced appropriations for the Department of uh, VHA, VHA. What, uh, are there some components of that, even though they have advanced appropriation, that you're not able to do because of IT or some other components of the VA that would actually hinder uh, VHA in providing the services that they need? Yeah. Well, we, we've uh, uh, this had these discussions in the past, uh, Congressman, uh, and you know that we're a little bit uh, bifurcated here. We get a uh, generosity of the Congress advance appropriations for our health administration. So they're fully funded in 1 October. Uh, so the question, how much of an impact? You know, 80% of VA is functioning because our hospitals are open, our community-based outpatient clinics are seeing patients, as are our vet centers. Um, and our uh, mobile uh, clinics. Um, and so uh, uh, that will continue, and uh, uh, the impact of them is, uh, is negligible. Uh, where we get a little bifurcated is where we have authorization to uh, do something with a facility, and then we have to wait for our IT budget to clear, and then we marry the two up. It's something we've worked in the past. Um, uh, are there easier ways to handle this? I think down the road, uh, perhaps worthy of discussion, but uh, for right now, that would not be able to turn on uh, checks on 1 November, and that's my great concern here, and I uh, don't want to be alarmist, but I want to speak for the veterans who are looking in on this. 
uh, not only do we have uh, a large number of beneficiaries that are looking for those uh, uh, checks, uh, I have veterans myself that I employ, uh, a third, over 100,000 veterans. Uh, a number of them are going to be subject uh, to furlough. And so if they are furloughed and they're also recipients of disability checks, their resources go to zero. And then I have uh, the responsibility of uh, trying to figure out how to keep them from becoming homeless. So this, and HUD plays in that game. So uh, this is a, a, a much larger uh, challenge for us. Thank you very much. I yield back. Mr. Denham. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, as the uh, Chairman outlined uh, in his opening statement recently, the House passed the Honoring Our Promise to America's Veterans Act, uh, that if signed into law would provide immediate funding for critical veterans benefits and services including disability claims, education, training, uh, and many of the items you discussed in your testimony. But you also made a, an important point when you stated that many services veterans rely on are not housed directly within VA, like the uh, Vets Employment Programs, the Small Business Administration Loans uh, are two of those examples you cited in your testimony. Could you expand on other types of these programs that uh, would be outside of that bill that we passed that is now sitting in the Senate? You mean other other departments that uh, are impacted by it? Impacted that impact our veterans that are outside of the VA uh, bill. Sure. Our, our claims uh, processing uh, requires by law uh, our uh, responsibility to check with the IRS for uh, income data, uh, with Social Security for uh, uh, other benefits. Um, and so that's part of the part of the process that we go through in, in uh, uh, so are, completing our claims. Are you saying then that if, even if the Senate passed the VA bill and the Senate were willing to uh, uh, sign that VA funding bill, that there would still be some challenges because of the interactivity with the yeah. IRS yeah. and their furloughs? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I, it depends on the issue, Congressman. Uh, it could have greater impact than in others, but the impact is there. Education, uh, you know, whether it's 9-11 GI Bill, Montgomery GI Bill, vocational rehabilitation and employment, there are uh, ties that go to the Department of Education. Um, so we are not an independent operator here. Uh, employment, veterans employment, a high priority for us and, and for all of you. Uh, Department of Labor plays in that. Uh, and as you indicated, the Small Business uh, Administration uh, does play as well. Thank you. And uh, second question, you and I have talked several times about French Camp, a facility that uh, borders uh, mine and, uh, and Congressman McNerney's district, uh, affecting all of our veterans. Um, the ongoing construction projects, um, can you outline what a protracted or a long delay in funding or a long uh, um, a long delay in funding would affect uh, both our const ongoing construction projects, the, the staff at the VA Office of Construction and Facilities Management, or the planning for future VA construction projects. Yeah. Uh, Congressman, if I might, I'll get back to you with specifics on French Camp um, at, at just a little more detail than that. I had time to brush up on, but just let me say that in the the office that overwatches uh, construction, uh, they also have acquisition, um, uh, logistics, and construction. So depending on which of those uh, topics, uh, they're variously affected uh, by the uh, uh, shutdown. Uh, in the case of construction, uh, for those construction activities that are underway, uh, those will continue. Uh, our oversight responsibilities will be reduced, uh, but uh, we will continue to provide oversight, um, you know, as best we can, ensuring that the requirements of the contract are met. Uh, here I'm talking about 52 projects and about $12 billion of construction, and the, the major projects uh, will continue. Design, on the other hand, uh, about 20 projects uh, uh, may be delayed and may be significantly delayed uh, depending on how long uh, this process goes. And so your question about French camp, I just need to find out exactly where we are in this process. Other aspects of this, major leasing actions, about 33 uh, projects uh, 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 liable to be delayed. And here, 
uh, examples would be the Greenville, North Carolina outpatient clinic, South Bend, Indiana, uh, community-based outpatient clinic, Butler, uh, Pennsylvania, HCC. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'd like to see these uninterrupted, uh, uh, but there will be some delays here, and significance will be determined by how long uh, the shutdown uh, continues. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Brownlee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here uh, with us today. And I certainly agree with your remarks on the importance of passing a complete and clean uh, continuing re resolution and uh, that will provide the certainty I think Americans are looking for in their government and their leaders. Um, as you know, last week the House uh, passed H.J. Resolution 72, uh, which was an attempt, I think, to provide um, some funding for our nation's uh, veterans um, in the middle of this debate that we're having. Um, I think that there, it, it clearly, uh, that particular bill, um, in my view, uh, still underfunded a lot of different areas. Um, and I wanted you, if you could, to just sort of um, speak to those. You've already mentioned, I think, a couple, but if you could comment um, a little bit more specifically around, uh, let's say, the medical and prosthetic budget um, that I don't believe was, was funded in that resolution. Um, the, you've mentioned something, I think, a little on the uh, technology piece, the Office of the Inspector General, the grants to VA homes, grants to state cemeteries and the like. If you could comment a little bit more specifically about the impacts there. Sure. Uh, as I indicated earlier, with advanced appropriations for our health care uh, administration, uh, a large portion of VA is fully funded. Uh, I would say uh, well over 70, approximately 80 percent uh, is funded, and those activities continue. There are uh, pieces of uh, our medical activities uh, that don't come under advanced appropriations, and so you cited a couple. Research is another area, and so those activities would stop until uh, we had a, a, a full budget. Thank you. And um, just to follow up on um, a, a, an area I don't think we've spoken uh, too much about so far, um, having to do with the GI Bill and what that will mean to veterans who are enrolled in colleges and universities across the country. Um, does that mean that they can't continue, they need to drop out? Um, how are we going to handle that? Yeah. So uh, what I would say here is that the uh, two accounts I'm dealing with, one is the carryover uh, appropriations of money that were not uh, expended in 13. Um, uh, they, this uh, carryover in the Benefits Administration, I think roughly $40 million, was used to keep that office open as long as possible to take care of all the various uh, categories of claims, education among them, disability, uh, pension, compensation, uh, vocational rehab, and education claims. Uh, that money uh, was exhausted on 7 uh, October, so on the 8th we furloughed over 7,800 uh, the workforce in, uh, in the Benefits Administration. I, we still have about 13,000 people working uh, because we have, under the uh, law, uh, declared them accepted. And they are accepted because in the other account, the mandatory funding account, uh, which currently has uh, money in it, but will, uh, that will end before the end of the month. And so we have these uh, folks processing claims and where it's appropriate to make a decision today and pay today, retroactive claims, for example, uh, to pay that uh, back pay, if you will, uh, we are doing that. But every time, every payment we make reduces the amount of mandatory funds, and before the end of the month, uh, this account will be uh, exhausted. At that point, these 13,000 or so people who are doing this will have no reason to continue to, to function because the necessary implication 
clause that allows them to work uh, uh, will be uh, exceeded when the mandatory account is uh, exhausted. And at that point, they will be furloughed, and our Veterans Benefits um, Administration uh, will be reduced to, you know, something over a thousand, uh, maybe less than 1,500 uh, folks who will continue to operate uh, in our 56 uh, regional offices uh, and our call center. And the reason for that is every veteran who submits a claim, we're required to accept it, date stamp it so there is a place in line uh, for them to be uh, uh, recognized when funding is restored. For education claims, uh, students who are currently uh, in school and as those come up, uh, we will pay those like we do, the retroactive claims. Uh, but at some point, that's a draw on the mandatory account, and uh, that will end before the end of this month, and I will uh, re be required to furlough a large portion of that 13,000 workforce. Thank you, sir, and again, I appreciate you being here. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Brownlee. Uh, Mr. Runyon, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Secretary. Um, thanks again for your testimony. <clears throat> kind of answered a couple of my questions over there, but um, what is the last day of this calendar month that you can process all award payments for time, timely receipt on the first of the month? Yeah, it's, it's again, it'll be later this month, uh, towards the end of the month. Uh, you know, the exact day is uh, going to be determined by, uh, pardon the term, the burn rate here. Uh, and once the mandatory account is no longer solvent, uh, then uh, yeah, we'll stop. But we are processing claims uh, as fast and as hard as we can, as we were before uh, 1 October. Uh, uh, to ensure that we get as many of those uh, claims uh, ready to be paid as soon as uh, the budget is provided. And that's the description I give our folks about uh, setting up your fighting position. Uh, when the budget is provided, we go to work and we start, you know, paying benefits. Has there any been any, any discussion within your department and or your staff on prior, prioritization of claims, i.e., fully disabled, that type of thing as you get near that deadline come the first of the month? Well, there are uh, uh, a good portion, I would say over 400,000 uh, 100 percent uh, disabled veterans who uh, will be affected by uh, our inability to uh, deliver checks on 1 November. Uh, Five million uh, beneficiaries over 5 million, 5.18 million, I think is a, a closer number. Uh, but they're a good portion of them, as I indicated, uh, uh, who are 100% disabled. And amongst them, you know, we have, there will be survivors, surviving spouses, uh, children uh, orphaned uh, by the death of uh, their service member or veteran parent. But do you, there's been no discussion of priority there. You're just doing it as as they go through the process. Um, while we're operating at, uh, you know, while we have the funds to operate, we do prioritize uh, in our processing of claims uh, for uh, uh, financially uh, uh, challenged uh, uh, veterans or uh, claimants, um, Medal of Honor recipients, former prisoners of war. Uh, terminally ill. Um, and then uh, we add to that fully developed claims because they're easier to process. But uh, in the processing business, that is where we give priority and then we work, you know, the uh, remainder of the claims. And I would say in uh, September, we uh, produced uh, the biggest uh, uh, production uh, output in, uh, since I've been here, 128,000 claims. Um, uh, but once it goes into the payment process, Congressman, then there is a, you know, sequence that goes along with uh, how they are uh, been put in line. Going to the, hopefully when we get out of this mess, um, obviously chairing the DAMA subcommittee here, dealing with the uh, claims is a, 
is a project. Um, can you provide information um, on VBA's funding and the future plans for use of uh, mandatory overtime to address the backlog? Um, I, I just, mandatory yeah. use in the future to Man attack the backlog. Mandatory overtime. Yeah. Um, you know, we use mandatory overtime, uh, and it's a device that's been used over the last several years when we uh, see an opportunity and uh, we want to get more production because for some reason we've gotten a little, uh, uh, you know, behind. Uh, and so in May, we declared we were going to do this until the end of the year. Um, our 2014 budget has $50 million in it for overtime. Uh, and that's essentially what I was counting on, on 1 October, to be able to transition to that. So we do have a plan. Uh, we do need uh, that piece of the budget recognized so we can uh, resume our uh, uh, overtime uh, uh, option. Uh, part of what we, as we began to close out the year, before we knew that a shutdown was going to occur, and as we were trying to assess how much carryover we were going to have, uh, we thought we were going to be able to carry over $40 million to apply, to add to the $50 million that's in the budget. So to give us, uh, you know, a, a good run at the year uh, of additional overtime. So the numbers would up, be up there, you know, uh, closer to $100 million, $90 million or so. Um, that $40 million was used to keep our operation going uh, for as long as possible to get as many claims lined up uh, before the end of the month. Mark, thank you for that, um, because we had a hearing about some difficulty with legislative affairs a couple of weeks back and have had issues with getting an answer like that from them, so I appreciate that and yep. yield back. Thank you, Mr. Runyon. Ms. Kirkpatrick, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. One of the important projects that the VA has been working on is the transition to a paperless system for claims benefit processing. Uh, and yet in your written testimony, you say on Monday, 2,764 OIT employees were furloughed and then the 7,800 uh, VBA employees furloughed yesterday. Uh, would you describe for me and for our committee what impact those furloughs are going to have on that tr transition to the paperless system right now, give us a snapshot right now this week, and then what it looks like if this shutdown continues into November. Yeah, uh, very important question. Uh, Congresswoman, as you know, uh, we have set a long-term uh, goal of ending the backlog in 2015. Uh, key to that have, uh, has been the automated system we put into place, and uh, we fielded that finished fielding that six months ahead of schedule uh, in June. Um, that's fielding the sort of the basic uh, model. Uh, and much like any IT operation, you have, uh, you know, uh, newer versions that add capability, give you more robustness, uh, and then reduce the workload. So all of those plans that have been in place, uh, uh, we've had to put a hold on. There is no new development work being done for VVMS, and there is much to be done if we're going to get this up to where we expected we would have it uh, to be able to hold our target of ending the backlog in 2015. Um, I haven't given up on that. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, we will have an opportunity here to get back on track. But the longer we go, the uh, more difficult uh, that becomes. Uh, what I would like to assure you, though, is that I am allowed uh, by the rules to maintain what we have. I can't add, I can't make it better, I can't increase capability, but I can and will uh, maintain the operation. So uh, if computers are having uh, problems, I have, uh, you know, sufficient workforce to be able to uh, uh, bring them back online. But basically what you're saying is, is any progress in that project has come to a screeching halt. That's correct. Uh, and let me just ask you, um, Secretary, uh, you, you are a general with, with an outstanding distinguished combat record and, uh, you know, Congress voted to pay federal employees uh, when the shutdown ends, so they're going to be paid. Uh, does it make any sense to you to not allow them to work? Uh, 
Uh, I can't think of uh, many. And they are ready to work. Uh, they are, I would just, you know, refer to the uh, uh, folks in the Benefits Administration who have uh, brought this backlog down, 193,000 claims in about 190 days. Uh, uh, lots of folks wondered whether we were going to be able to do it. Uh, VBMS will be important to that effort, but VBMS is just coming online. So all of this work was done by uh, good folks in the, the Benefits Administration. Um, I would. I would speak for them. They're disappointed that uh, the ground they gained uh, is being lost day by day. Well, I just want to thank you for your leadership with the, under the department and thank your employees for uh, their good hard work. Thank you. And I yield back. Thank you very much. I'd like to remind my colleague that only the House uh, has passed a bill that would allow for furloughed workers. The Senate continues to hold fast in not helping us resolve this particular situation. Dr. Beneshek. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here today. I, I like all my colleagues, would like to see this shutdown well, put behind us as soon as possible. And uh, frankly, wish that the appropriation process went on in regular order, that we would have passed the appropriate appropriations for all of the segments of our, of our government. I'm happy that the House has passed. Uh, military construction and VA uh, bill in a bipartisan fashion and, and hope that the Senate acts on that. And frankly, I, I think that the entire government should be funded in that, in that usual fashion, that this policy of continuing resolution <coughs> is just a bad policy. But nevertheless, um, you know, I understand that we have to get something done. I had a couple of questions uh, about uh, the, the communication between the, the, the VA and, and the committee here. I, as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that apparently the department issued a notice uh, in late September that 95% of VA employees would be either fully funded or exempted from furloughs. Um, you know, is that incorrect? Um, I would uh, ask for the opportunity to go and retrieve whatever this uh, announcement uh, you're referring to. But I would say that if you look at VA as a whole, 90% uh, of us are in VHA, and they are fully funded. And so as of 1 October, our hospitals are uh, uh, seeing patients, uh, community-based outpatient clinics are operating. So uh, if this is the 95% per that's being referred to, I would say uh, uh, I can understand why that information was provided. Um, but again, uh, Congressman, you know, trying to close out 13 and understanding what kind of uh, resource capability we're going to have, expecting that we're going to have a budget on 1 October, knowing that VHA had a budget because it was passed last year uh, through the uh, advanced appropriations uh, uh, provision that you all have provided. Uh, so I, I think the 95 percent here is referring to VHA because of advanced Yeah, approach. okay. Um, and frankly, I tend to agree with you on, on the advanced funding issue. You know, I, frankly, I don't see why we don't have two-year budgeting for everything. Uh, you know, allow us more time to get these appropriations done. But uh, the president on September 30th indicated that some PTSD counseling would be affected by the shutdown. Um, is that true? Um, I, I would say we are open for business at uh, VA and. Uh, um, I, I, I believe, as, as I've said, we have uh, ties to other departments. Um, the IHS, uh, NHHS, the Indian Health Service, we have veterans being served there uh, who, uh, if those operations are not funded, uh, are not being seen for any variety of uh, requirements, PTSD being one. Right, okay. uh, Nat uh, Alaskan natives that uh, we, uh, who are veterans that we provide uh, services to, to through either the consortium there or through IHS um, are probably not uh, being seen. So, uh, and that's why I say uh, we can focus on VA as long as we understand that there's a broader. Team. Right. And, uh understand that the cooperation with other departments is, is going to be hindered by this situation. Uh, there are no medical centers that 
being shut down though, right? There's no the, all the all the C box are are going to be open. Is that that's correct? Is that right? Uh, there is one that's affected, and that is the North Chicago um, Level Healthcare Center. It's a joint uh, uh, initiative between the United States Navy and uh, and VA. Um, it operates off a joint account in which we each contribute dollars. Uh, so that is affected. Uh, why, the, why is that being affected? I mean, I thought we funded the, the president that, signed uh, the bill that funds the, the, mil the military. Uh, the authorization to uh, uh, continue to fund that is, uh, is, uh, is the issue. Uh, however, we have accepted uh, all of the civilian staff accepted, meaning that they will continue to work, continue to see service members and, and veterans and families, um, and then we'll look for an opportunity then uh, to uh, uh, make right, uh, right their compensation. Well, I know I, I would really like to get this behind us, and I uh, take this opportunity to urge my Senate colleagues to come to the table, and let's get this figured out. So thank you very much. I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Benishek. Ms. Custer, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you, Secretary Shinseki, for being with us today. Um, my question has to do with the vet centers and the services that, um, in my district in New Hampshire, are particularly valuable, the counseling, the group therapy, um, and just having a place to go. And I'm, I'm just wondering uh, where this falls in the... Um, shut down. Yep. All 300 centers will continue to operate. They are covered uh, under the uh, Health uh, Administration's appropriation, so they are funded for the, the year. Okay, thank you. And then uh, my next question has to do with the um, the November 1st payments. Um, could you give us a, a more accurate sense here? I mean, we very much want clean continuing resolution, get the country back to work, get the government back to work. Um, but each day that goes by seems to be critical in this. Is there, I would imagine, with the number of checks that go out, there's a process and a procedure that takes a period of time. Could you give us a sense, you've talked about the end of the month, could you give us a sense of the number of days um, that a delay uh, in reopening the government would cause a delay in those payments being received after the 1st of November? Uh, sure. If uh, the mandatory account, uh, it's the account against which I am writing checks, so to speak, processing claims and having them ready to be executed. But as that account has uh, demands written against it, it is exhausted at some point before the end of the month. and. The reason I can't be more specific mm -hmm. is the, the rate at which I'm able to do this. Uh, but at uh, uh, before the end of the month, I, the mandatory account will not support payments in November. Um, even though I have uh, uh, checks, uh, you know, uh, lined up to draw against it. Um, I think uh, I indicated $6.25 billion of requirements. and. Okay. Uh, I'll be down to about two billion dollars, and if I can't uh, pay it all, it stops. And it, so, on one November, right now, unless I can uh, provide mandatory funding to uh, make the, sol the account solvent again, one November, uh, I will not be sending checks out. And could you give us a sense of the scope of that? Um, the types of people whose lives will be irreparably harmed and and sure. uh, sort of the categories and the numbers of that devastation? Uh, I, I think uh, I gave uh, sort of a rough population here of 5.18 million beneficiaries and these are compensation payments, uh, these are pension payments, uh, these are education payments and uh, vocational rehabilitation and employment payments as well and uh, within this category are veterans. They're also service members because we have active duty uh, members who participate in some of our programs. Uh, we have surviving spouses and children who've lost parents. And um, I know you can't speculate as to people's lives, but would you say that these are people that 
generally don't have um, a lot of savings to fall back on that missing this type of disability yeah. check or this type of compensation check could really set them back. Yeah. Mo mo our, our eligibility for uh, VA benefits is usually uh, income-based. And, and so I would say that uh, uh, a large portion of the beneficiaries we service are uh, uh, lower waged uh, and uh, are in need of our help. Uh, there will be those who, uh, by virtue of the severity of their combat injuries, will qualify uh, because of that. Uh, but by and large, uh, our patient population is older, uh, sicker, and uh, in need of uh, support. Thank you, Mr. Sir Secretary. And I yield back my time. I hope that I appreciate you coming today, and I hope that your testimony will cause all of us to redouble our efforts to get the government back to work service. Mr. Secretary, did I hear you say that disability is income-based disability rating? No, I, I said there are some because of, uh, by virtue of the severity of their disabilities, come in at a higher category here. Uh, so people, but people in the lower with, categories, uh, people uh, with shaving bumps or sleep apnea or hemorrhoids or all those disabilities that are out there today, that that's they get that regardless of the income, correct? Uh, well, Mr. Chairman, you're getting into some uh, detail here that I probably want to give you a better answer for. Okay. Um, I, I would just tell you that, uh, I just, and I'll, I, I'll do my best to answer your question on, on some of those issues, but 1 November, no mandatory account, 5.18 million beneficiaries do not receive checks. And in response to the Congresswoman's question, a large portion of them our, uh, dis our, our compensation or our <laughs> beneficiary uh, checks are uh, crucial to their uh, being able to uh, you know, have order in their lives. Mr. Hulescamp. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity and I really uh, find this a difficult question to ask you, Mr. Uh, Shinseki, uh, given the discussion we've had. but. Uh, do you think Senator Reid uh, doesn't like our veterans or the VA in particular? And it is a tough question. The re reason I ask that, Mr. Secretary, is that uh, as the chairman has indicated, uh, 127 days ago, the U.S. House passed the appropriations. 105 days ago, the Appropriations Committee actually sent it to the floor of the U.S. Senate. And for 105 days now, Senator Harry Reid has refused to bring the appropriations to a vote in the U.S. Senate. Uh, have you visited with the senator and asked him, could you please, uh, Mr. Reid, bring that to a vote in the U.S. Senate? Yeah, Mr. Hillscamp, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer the question about Senator Reid uh, personally. I think uh, he uh, very highly value, values veterans. As to why uh, uh, we are unable the Congress is unable to do its business, I, I will leave uh, to the members to discuss. Okay. Uh, well, and I appreciate that, and uh, you mentioned Congress, but it, it is a issue in the U.S. Senate. And I have you visited with, with the Senator and, and see if the preparations, I, I'll note, I, I've been disappointed in, in the House that uh, four out of 12 appropriations bill is all we passed uh, through the U.S. House, and that includes a year budget. That means 8 out of 12 have not passed here, but 12 out of 12 have not passed in the U.S. Senate, and that's been the case now since 2009. Uh, is there any indication in, in your visits with the Senator that uh, they, they would consider at least passing your appropriations, uh, Mr. Nsecki, and I appreciate the work you've done to continue to uh, meet the needs of our veterans in this uh, shutdown period? Yeah. Uh, yeah, to your specific question, have I visited Senator Reid over this? I, I would uh, answer I have not. Okay. Uh, it is not something that I would uh, ordinarily do. Uh, I deal with this committee, 
and uh, with the appropriate committee in the Senate when it comes to my budget, and that's uh, where the work is done. And, and I haven't compared the, the budget that came out of the Senate Appropriations Committee uh, compared to, to what came uh, through the House by a pretty wide margin, and, and hopefully it would meet your needs. I would encourage uh, perhaps that conversation to take place. I would ask you uh, specifically about cemeteries. Uh, are, are all your cemeteries still open and, uh, and for business, and would they be impacted uh, in late October like you have indicated for other programs? Yeah, uh, Congressman, uh, that's a great question. I will tell you that um, our operations will continue. Um, at some point here in the next uh, days to weeks, uh, we will expend our carryover uh, monies uh, for NCA, and uh, we will be furloughing a good portion of the force. However, uh, our cemeteries will uh, go into a modified uh, burial schedule, which means we will continue uh, taking care of families and bury burying uh, our honored, uh, but it won't be at the rate that we had planned or uh, would like. Our cemeteries uh, will be open for our normal hours, which is sunrise to sunset. Uh, you may see some of our uh, maintenance standards go a bit uh, because we won't be able to maintain uh, the high standards we would like to have, but that's all retrievable once we have a budget. Uh, but the focus here is on taking care of families on the most painful day uh, for them and making sure they feel that uh, their veteran is uh, respected and has been accorded uh, a dignified burial. Well, thank you, Mr. Secretary. I appreciate that assurance. and, and uh and your current work to, to make sure that's available for our veterans and, and uh, obviously their families as well. I mean, you've seen the the, the images of uh, other uh, uh, federal uh, places and, and locations that have been barricaded to our veterans. And uh, but I want to make certain we we keep the cemeteries open and appreciate your work in doing that and and making certain that does occur. And I yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. And I think it does go without saying that we all care about the veterans of this country and what we do have is a failure to communicate, negotiate, uh, and there has been a breakdown in the institutional process uh, of how appropriation bills are in fact uh, passed through both houses of Congress. If I'm not mistaken, I think the uh, VA Milcon bill that has been passed out of the House only had four dissenting votes. So suffice it to say that it was an extremely bipartisan piece of legislation. Mr. Waltz, you recognize. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to echo that. I'd like to give the gentleman 30 seconds to apologize, Senator Reid, if he'd like to do that. That's beneath this Congress and certainly beneath this committee on questioning someone's commitment to veterans. We may have differences on policy and ideology. We certainly don't have differences on love of this country. So I would give my 30 seconds to the gentleman if he wishes to claim it. Thank you, Mr. Waltz. And I was asking the question, uh, given that it's very clear, as the chairman's indicated, that uh, Senator Reid controls the counter and has the opportunity to move that bill to the floor. And since this shutdown has occurred, unless there were some recorded votes yesterday, we've had seven days in which there's been not a single... I reclaim my time. Um, disappointed, to say the least. I hope that goes on record. Um, but one of the things I would say about this is this committee, and I'm incredibly proud to serve on it, um, is a place, one of the few places that still works in Congress. The collaboration in here is incredible. Uh, the work that's done down to the granular level by subcommittees actually have power, and that's a, that's a testament to you, Mr. Chairman, that you give that power to people. And I sat in this very chair arguing and making the case for advanced appropriations on VHA with my colleagues, and we did that. That was progress. We've sat here and made progress. You know. Mr. Secretary, the work you've done, I'm incredibly proud of it, and I've said it time and time again. I'm your staunchest supporter, but your harshest critic. When you get it wrong and something happens in Pittsburgh, we bring it up here and we discuss it and we figure out how to make it better. And the conscience that sets behind you representing millions of veterans expects that of us. And, uh, and it still works. And what's so disappointing about this is, and, and what's so disappointing when we get into this, we're wasting valuable time and resources by a self-inflicted wound that should be going towards our veterans. And, and, and it is so frustrating and, and what happens, and I, I appreciate my colleagues on this, but here's what happens. It starts to be cancerous into this committee. Last week, um, when, when the bill came up on the veterans to try and do a mini-CR and to try and make the case, 
be very clear about this. That you're trying to find ways, and I respect that, but in that bill, and Mr. Runyon was out in Preston and held a field hearing and made a great case for a veteran's cemetery that's been needed for decades in southern Minnesota. There's a grant process that you administer, Mr. Secretary, that ranked us number one. Three weeks ago, we got that notice, and there was a thank you from thousands, 56,000 veterans in southern Minnesota and northern Iowa that were going to get that. Last week's bill zeroed that out. Now, I know you didn't do that on purpose to stick it in the eye of my veterans, but I can't support that. But within 180 seconds of my vote, the campaign committee on the Republican side sent out an attack that I don't support veterans by not doing that. There's lots of reasons to tell people not to vote for me. Not supporting veterans isn't one of them. We've worked as partners to get that right. And that's where we get the point where people's disgust, people's anger, people's frustration, we can come together. And um, the, the, the continuous going back and forth, the continuous question, I don't question a single person's commitment to our veterans of love of their country. I think you're wrong on some of the policies. This is the place to debate that. Not a martial law rule that goes to the floor with no amendments so the campaign committees can send out an attack ad and try and win an election. My veterans are sitting at home saying, why do I hate Congress? Do I need to see any more proof? Um, so, Mr. Secretary, I'm, I, I'm frustrated you're here. I, I appreciate you trying to go with this. I understand where some of the questions is going, that this wouldn't just be so bad if you just prioritize differently and pick the stuff I like and not the other stuff. But the questions I were going to ask you answered, uh, interagency collaboration is, is breaking down. That is incredibly important. It helps move forward. IT, and as it impacts electronic medical records that we fought together for seven years, I've been sitting here trying to get that right, that progress is going backwards. So uh, I, I don't really have any questions for you. I, I trust that you, and, and, and the thing I would say about this is, the comment that we shouldn't be talking about furloughs or whatever, the VA is an organization of people. Furloughs are the most critical issue in that. There's a reason that VA healthcare is the best in the world. It's because of the people. And when those people have uncertainty, those people are laid off, those people are not there, it can impact. That's why we advanced appropriated. But you know it yourself. Mr. Runyon asked a beautiful question. I'm in 100% agreement with him. Not having the IT budget advanced appropriated has a beautiful MRI machine unhooked in New Jersey that can't help patients in some cases. Brought that up. That doesn't make any sense. And we need to, we should be today talking about that. And I compliment and end with the chairman and the ranking member have approached this the right way. The fix to this and the way to remove veterans, and we anticipated three years ago when we did advanced appropriations, remove veterans from this fight, don't allow people to grandstand and use them as pawns, and continue the work to go forward. Their suggestion on the advanced appropriation on the full VA funding is the way to go. And with that, I thank you and I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Waltz. If I can uh, ask the committee's indulgence for just one second. Uh, and recognize Ms. Kirkpatrick for a uh, introduction. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just wanted to uh, welcome to the committee Mr. and Mrs. Somers, who are in the back of the room. Uh, their son Daniel, an Arizona veteran, committed suicide earlier this year. Uh, we're going to be doing a roundtable with them in this committee room at 1.30. And so I just wanted to acknowledge their presence in committee, welcome, and uh, invite everybody to participate in the roundtable at 1.30. Thank you, very much, Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. We welcome the summers to the committee room and to Congress. We certainly add our condolences to you and thank you for your son's service, and we are extremely sorry for your loss. With that, Mr. Amaday, you are recognized. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, going back to the uh, the cemetery thing for just a second under the heading of triage until something changes do your present procedures allow on a case-by-case -case basis if there is private funding available to go ahead and either compensate the VA personnel at cemeteries to perform burials in a timely manner is there anything that would prevent if somebody said listen we want to pay the expense to go ahead and do this in the normal instead of warehousing people is, is there an ability to, is there anything that prohibits that from happening uh, Congressman, I'm, I'm not aware that there is anything that prohibits that. Uh, uh, but again, we, you know, try to serve all the veterans uh, that come to us in as equitable a manner as we can, at least the appearance of um, uh, equal treatment. And so, uh, just let me research that and uh, come back to you. What I, what I will tell you is we continue our burial operations. 
uh, just at a rate less than we are accustomed to. Last year, uh, 122,000 uh, veterans were laid to rest. Uh, well, and, and I appreciate production. that. I, I'm just saying, if an instance developed somewhere in the country at a cemetery where somebody says it's going to be a few weeks, and they say we'll go ahead and incur the expense, or somebody comes forward and says we'll occur, we will incur the expense to have it happen in three days from now or something like that, it's not something. Or, or I, I guess my question that you'll get back to me on is: yeah. is there's nothing that prohibits an infusion of funds from a non-appropriated private source? to allow somebody to do that in whatever the customary manner is in the instance. Uh, Congress, Congressman, my guess is if it were permitted, I would be doing it now. Uh, my guess is that these are uh, funded positions and uh, people have been put on furlough uh, uh, because of uh, uh, the law. And I want to be careful here that I uh, don't suggest that we have ways to work around it, but I will take a look at it. Well, and, and I appreciate it. When you look at it, make very certain it is at no cost to the government, so it's reimbursement for whatever the costs are. So if furloughed people have to be brought back at non-government expense, then there, then there better be a pretty long opinion that says, no, we will not allow somebody to pay our folks to inter these people in the normal course of events, yes. whatever that expense may be. And with that, I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, may I just uh, just uh, yes, conclude this thought, Mr. Chairman? Uh, I would say that the law directed uh, furlough, and it's less the cost, but it's the uh, uh, decision that uh, drove us to do this, and I want to be sure that I'm clear on the law before I answer you. Uh, it's, less, it's less how much it costs. I think there is a requirement for me here to be in compliance. Well, well, well then if I may, Mr. Chairman, to that, I, I think there is also a requirement for you to look at the overall mission, which is bigger than the law. So when you look at those laws, I get the furlough. I just want to make sure that everything in VA is looked at so that those trying to be interred in a cemetery get the full benefit of all the laws before you know, the little situation that we're in now. Fair Thank you. I'm happy to do that. And Mr. Secretary, I know we're still in a very fluid situation, but we reached out and asked, you know, we were talking about uh, PTS and Indian Health Service and whether or not they could get their health uh, provided there. It says employees at the Indian Health service, which provide direct health service to tribal citizens, will largely be unaffected by the shutdown, and that they would continue to provide direct clinical health care services as well as referrals for contract services that cannot be provided through through their clinics. So, you know, again, we, we we're just somewhat confused as to the comment that was made in regard to post-traumatic stress, which I think everybody on this committee is very concerned with, and I and and. I get it. Your statement that you came in here with today paints the worst possible picture that's out there. But in your statement, it does not talk about the hundreds of thousands of VA employees that are still working and the health care that's provided. So we just want to be honest uh, with the questions and the comments that are provided. I'm not saying that you were not. I'm just saying that there was a, a an inference earlier on that veterans with post-traumatic stress would not, in fact, get their treatment. And we're finding uh, that there appears to be no corner anywhere in which they will not have that uh, treatment provided to them. Uh, Mr. O'Rourke, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Secretary, thank you for the, the presentation and your answers and responses to our questions and, and statements so far. I think they've been helpful. Um, I wanted to add to a comment you made about um, the VA and veterans being dependent on other federal departments and agencies that may or may not be funded in a piecemeal, mini continuing resolution uh, approach. Um, I, I want to note that there are nearly 600,000 veterans who work for the federal government, and that uh, constitutes nearly 30% of the entire federal workforce. So, these men and women who've served our country who are being furloughed or who are working without a clear idea of when they're being paid are being hurt regardless of what we're able to do when it comes to uh, funding the VA and the different agencies and departments within the VA. Um, that's especially important to me as a representative for El Paso, Texas, where we have the fifth highest concentration of federal employees of any community in the country. 43,000 people that I represent work for the federal government. And, you know, if, if that 27% holds true, uh, well over 10,000 of them 
uh, our veterans who are being affected by this, this current shutdown. So I think it adds to the point that you made that we cannot afford to look at this on a piecemeal basis. And when I look at the options to get out of this, I want to, in the spirit of cooperation, join my colleagues in urging the Senate and our federal government to move forward on advanced funding uh, for military construction and veterans affairs. I think that's critical. Um, in, in the short term, uh, I think our best option is uh, what everyone refers to as a clean funding bill or a clean CR uh, that funds all of your services and programs and personnel uh, at a sustainable level. The piecemeal approach that we saw last week uh, and uh, I appreciate those who, who wanted to address the issue that way, uh, but it had zero dollars for medical and prosthetic research, no funding for the National Cemetery Administration, no money for general administration, information technology, at a point where we're trying to get veterans who want to file fully developed claims to do that online, because when they do that, their wait time, which is now 450 days in El Paso, comes down under 100 days. And if we're not funding IT, we're not helping them to get the response that they need and that they deserve and that they've earned. Construction on major projects and on minor projects is zeroed out, as are grants to state VA homes and to state cemeteries. That's why I support a clean funding bill, no strings attached. Let's fund the entire federal government, perhaps on a short-term basis where we can work out some larger deal. That, to me, is the quickest cleanest way to help everyone involved, especially our veterans. And I think that's why um, presidents and leaders of national veteran service organizations have come out against a piecemeal approach. They want to see us tackle this comprehensively. I know that's what you are trying to do, and I think that's what ultimately uh, all of us want to do. To add to those, those national VSOs, we reached out uh, yesterday to our local VSOs said, I'm going to have a chance to, to ask questions of the secretary, would like to know what you want me to ask. And, and much of it you've already addressed. Timothy Blodgett of the DAV Post 165 says, the VBA budget is just as important as the VHA budget. And I think we all agree with that. We want to see that that's hap that, that, that moves forward. David Nevadas of the American GI Forum is concerned about an issue that you brought up. What happens if the shutdown persists and we have veterans who are now in homes who are homeless? Will you have the resources uh, to take care of them? Richard Britton, uh, vice commander of the American Legion, uh, talks about shutdown exacerbating problems that veterans already have. David Garcia, commander of the DAV Post 187, talks about veterans who are recipients of VA and Social Security benefits uh, having a really hard time after November 1st. And then Kay Davis, president of Veterans of Foreign Wars, actually came up with a solution. Uh, her solution was term limits for members of Congress uh, if we're unable to, to figure this problem out. But, but the frustration and the questions really are not with you. They are with us and with the need to respond to this in a way that will get the government up and running, functioning again for all departments because veterans work in all of them, for all veteran services because veterans are impacted by all of them, and again, from my perspective, the quickest, cleanest way to do this, and we could have the government up and running tonight, is to vote for a clean funding bill. So, uh, Mr. Secretary, again, thank you for your presence today, for answering our questions and commenting on our statements. My time is up, so I'll yield back to the chairman, but thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kaufman. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. And, uh, um, um, also, uh, thank the men and women that work. I'd like to thank the men and women who work for your department uh, to take care of those who have made so many sacrifices in defense of our freedom. Uh, uh, my question goes to the four uh, hospitals that are under construction uh, by the VA. And uh, VA contingency plan states that certain, quote, uh, major construction and facilities management support functions will be suspended, unquote, during the shutdown. Um, what has been the status uh, of the four ongoing major projects uh, uh, in Aurora, Las Vegas, Orlando, and New Orleans uh, during the shutdown? Uh, uh, Congressman, uh, I, I indicated that uh, where we have work uh, underway on site, that work will continue. Uh, our administrative oversight uh, responsibilities uh, will be diminished, but we will, we will exercise those responsibilities. Payment. Uh, payments to contractors and therefore payments to uh, uh, the subs 
uh, an administrative process that will be slowed, uh, but uh, in time payment will be made. We just don't have the, uh, the folks to do that as uh, robustly as we would like. Uh, but in terms of uh, site work uh, with supervision, that will continue in those uh, locations you described. Mr. Secretary, as you know, it's the, the payment has already been, the process has already been very slow, yep. according to a GAO re report that came out in uh, April. Um, w what have, um, in terms of these uh, setbacks that you talk about, um, uh, will they affect, in your view, the completion date and the budget totals for each project for these four major hospitals? Uh, our, our work is uh, uh, slowed. Uh, the longer this goes, uh, we, we do, uh, I would be concerned that we begin to affect the, uh, the end of the project, that we continue to slide project uh, execution uh, to the right. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Takano. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wish to associate myself with the remarks uh, from the, of the, with the gentleman from uh, Texas, uh, Mr. O'Rourke. I think he stated very clearly my sentiments about what needs to be done to clean CR. Um, and I also want to thank the chairman for the tone he set um, for this committee. Um, very bipartisan sentiments. I think you, Mr. Chairman, uh, understand that each of us on this committee, regardless of party, um, have a deep um, and sincere commitment to our nation's veterans. So I thank you for that, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me also state that, um, you know, beyond, beyond the bipartisan bill that we passed uh, on MILCON veterans, um, uh, even the Budget Control Act of 2011 reflects that bipartisan uh, spirit in the fact that it exempted um, the Veterans Administration from sequestration cuts. And it's my belief that, uh, it's my conjecture that what is happening in the Senate and the holdup with uh, consideration of this bill has to do with the complexities of sequestration and the divisions that um, that are occurring between our two sides. I mean, there's a reluctance to, to pass um, all the uh, appropriations bills until we see in total um, what we're dealing with in terms of whether we're going to, uh, how we're going to have to deal with uh, uh, that limit, whether we're going to lift it or some negotiations going to happen over that. We need to get to uh, negotiations on the bigger, on the, on the bigger picture. Um, I, I cherish this committee. I cherish being on it because it is one of one corner of the Congress that is still functional. Um, and I want to fight fiercely to uh, keep uh, that spirit. And I, I, I thank the chairman for uh, uh, the, the small ways in this committee that he's uh, tried to keep that alive. And I have to, I yield back to balance my time. I have to get back to a meeting in my office. Thank you very much. Uh, looks like Dr. Winstrup is gone. Mr. Bilirakis, you're recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for your testimony, General. Uh, General, let's summarize again. I walked in just a little late uh, in your statement, but uh, which programs I understand because of legislation that we passed, uh, the, the VA, the healthcare, uh, the outpatient clinics, the hospital, the CBOX are protected. Is that correct? They will not be impact, impacted. Uh, but tell me which programs will be impacted because of the due to the shutdown. I think our constituents have a right to know. And if you could briefly summarize, I'd appreciate it very much. Uh, Congressman, the uh, Veterans Health Administration, uh, because of uh, its uh, special uh, opportunity to have advanced appropriations, uh, courtesy of the Congress, uh, is funded. And so that's uh, hospitals, medical centers, hospitals, uh, vet centers. Uh, community-based outpatient clinics and every version of health care uh, center in between. No exception, correct? No. No exception. They will be uh, The only exception uh, where there is uh, impact is the North Chicago, uh, where I say it is operating, uh, but it's in an accepted uh, category. Everyone else in the VA system is uh, fully funded. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, which programs will be impacted, in your opinion? 
and if you can give me some deadlines. I know we went through a lot of this, but I'd like for you to summarize. Yeah, uh, for well, us um, all the other programs that are not advanced uh, funded uh, are impacted and being impacted. And uh, some of this is uh, uh, the degree to which uh, and, and when they're going to be impacted is a function of how much 2013 uh, residual carryover funds uh, we have available, uh, a uh, device that the Congress authorizes, uh, certain percentages that we are allowed to uh, uh, use as carryover to uh, uh, transition between uh, budget years. Uh, but if this continues, uh, every one of our uh, departments uh, will be impacted. Uh, we have a requirement in the Benefits Administration even if we have uh, expended the mandatory uh, account and therefore have no uh, necessary implication, this is one of the clauses for exception, uh, to keep people working, at that point there will be a significant uh, uh, requirement to furlough a workforce uh, who will be working until the end of this month, towards the end of this month. Uh, thereafter, we will have roughly uh, uh, a thousand folks uh, uh, operating in the 30, uh, 56 uh, regional offices to ensure that we can receive, account, date stamp, and control uh, claims that uh, are, will continue to be submitted, uh, both uh, through the normal process and through the call center. So there are uh, people working in the call center as well. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yield back. Thank you, General. Mr. Grete McLeod. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, I, I know that you said that the VA not only deals with the VA, but other uh, uh, departments also. And so those veterans receiving educational benefits and uh, stipends under the GI Bill and that are going to be, that are attending school now because school has already started at various institutions, what will happen uh, after November the 1st? You know, if they won't get their money, uh, have you talked to the colleges, the institutions, the universities? Uh, uh, Congresswoman, uh, 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 we are doing everything we can uh, while we have mandatory funds available. Uh, the, at least two accounts that, uh, uh, two categories that uh, we will expend money to cover immediately. One is the retroactive uh, aspects of a claim. Uh, so someone who is due money uh, for uh, previous authorization up until this point, uh, to the best of our ability, we pay those. And for students currently in school, we pay those as well. Uh, but that draws down this mandatory account I'm speaking about. So on 1 November, uh, before the end of this month, uh, it'll be in a, a uh, situation where I can no longer uh, pay. Uh, and the 1 November uh, payments that should be going out uh, will not be able to do that unless uh, more mandatory funding is provided. So it's, uh, if there is funding in the mandatory account, which has uh, got to come through appropriation, uh, then I can accept people to continue to work to draw that down. Without that, uh, by law, I have to furlough these folks. So what happens to students that are already in classes that have already started the semester or the quarter, whichever they're on? Well, uh, at this point, uh, this is a crucial question because uh, for uh, students who have already registered and had their tuition and fees uh, paid up front, I think they're going to be okay. Where, uh, And if they have drawn their book stipend, uh, uh, then I think they're... Uh, probably uh, covered. Every situation is different. But I will not be able to pay the monthly uh, housing stipend. And that, that, that would be an issue. Have the schools or the universities or the colleges made um, any kind of... I, I'm sure they're aware of our shenanigans here. So. Well, I, I, uh, I can assure you we've reached out to schools um, and uh, doing the best we can to get their support and cooperation to be able to carry this uh, for uh, uh, payment. 
but the schools are not involved in the housing stipend. That's directly from uh, VA to the students, so that is an issue. Uh, and I would tell you that in my uh, uh, past experience, the schools have been uh, quite cooperative, but there are 6,000 of them, and so uh, we want to be sure that you know we have contact with all of them. Thank you so much for your testimony, Dave. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Ms. Walorski. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good to see you again, uh, Mr. Secretary. You had uh, mentioned earlier that South Bend Seabock would be delayed. We were notified um, more than four weeks ago there was already a delay in the South Bend Seabock. So my question is, it obviously has nothing to do with this government shutdown. So would your plan then be to expedite that Seabock once the furloughed workers are back? And if something was delayed prior to a shutdown, that it would be expedited after a shutdown? Yeah, I, we'll do our best to get back on schedule. Uh, it, it was going uh, slower than we would like, uh, but this has just exacerbated the situation. Uh, but our effort will be to get all of these projects uh, back online as uh, soon as we can. And then my second question, I appreciate that. My second question is, according to the most recent Monday morning report, the Indianapolis Regional Office has 11,460 claims pending has nothing to do with the government shutdown. This is prior to the shutdown. And these claims are taking an average of 402 days to complete. Over a year still in the state of Indiana to process these claims. So my first question is, is there an urgent plan when these furlough workers come back to deal with these hot spots in the country? And number two, if this furlough plan retroactive fairness act is signed by the president, are your employees coming back to work the next morning? Uh, I don't know about the next morning, but as soon as they're notified, we expect that they'll be in uh, promptly. And then what would the plan be for high-impact areas like Indiana with 11,000 veterans by no fault of their own, no fault of a government shutdown, sitting for over a year still waiting for claims to be mitigated on their behalf? Yeah. Well, Congresswoman, again, I think uh, you recall we have uh, uh, made decisions that created an increase in the inventory and increase in the backlog. and. Uh, we predicted three years ago that that uh, backlog would uh, you know, sort of hit the high point uh, this year, and it did on 25 March. Uh, since that time, we prioritized uh, claims are older than two years. That essentially 99% of those are done. Uh, claims that are uh, one year of age or older, uh, we're well into the 80% of taking that down from like 300,000 down into the double digits here. Uh, I'll have to look at Indi Indianapolis and, and see what the issues are. Uh, but they would be in this uh, prioritization that we've been in. Anything older than one year we intended to have done uh, here before the end of uh, this year. Um, and we're on a track to do that um, and like to get back on it. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back my time. Ms. Titus, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, for uh, being here. I will apologize, if some won't, for the inappropriate attempt by people to drag you into the politics of this unfortunate situation. Um, I'm the ranking member of the Disability Assistance Subcommittee, and I carefully monitor those Monday morning reports. I guess we won't be able to get those now once because of this uh, unnecessary shutdown. Uh, and I'm optimistic about the strides you've made. We've heard in that committee about the 80% of the one-year uh, backlog, the 99% of the two-year backlogs. Uh, I think it's remarkable progress, and I'm, it's just a crying shame that some of that is going to now be pushed back because of this, uh, this shutdown. We've spoken a number of times about what's happening in the Reno office, which serves Las Vegas. It also has uh, very long waiting periods, but we've addressed some of that. General Hickey has been out to visit. Uh, that, that's kind of in 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 process and making some progress. There's still a long way to go. But I've been hearing some conflicting reports about the closing of the regional offices. Some closed, some not. Could you kind of uh, go into some detail about how that choice is being made or, or what's happening in those regional offices during this shutdown? Yeah. Uh, Congresswoman, a, I sort of laid out a timeline here that uh, I have uh, uh, roughly at the Benefits Administration, just round figures, about 20,000 people 
Uh, nearly 8,000 of them have been furloughed uh, two days ago. Mm -hmm. uh, the remaining 12, 13,000 continue to work because there is there are mandatory funds available in the account, uh, and I continue to draw down on that. At the point that mandatory uh, account is depleted before the end of this month, that mm -hmm. will happen. Uh, at that point, I have no necessary implication uh, to continue to have this workforce present. And at that point, uh, I will, uh, we will uh, be forced to furlough uh, these individuals. The law requires it. Uh, beyond that, uh, we will keep a, a small workforce uh, present. Uh, my understanding is all the regional offices and the national call center will have presence in order to receive claims, date stamp claims, and control that property uh, for the veterans who have uh, made the effort to submit them. Uh, but it will be a uh, much reduced uh, uh, operation, uh, receipt only, and no processing. But you won't be making choices, say, between the Waco office and the Reno office or the Indianapolis office. It's going to be across the board? That's correct. And if somebody walks in, will there be someone there to receive a claim? They just won't be able to get information about the progress of their claim? Is that basically how it will work? I, I will say yes, the claims can be submitted. Uh, I will have, if, by location, we are in facilities that are run by the General Services Administration and, and merely walking in, I will have to find out exactly uh, how that goes. But uh, we are not uh, sole occupants of many of the uh, regional offices, uh, many of the buildings in which our regional offices are located. Uh, but that's a good point. I mean, that's something I will go check on. And if they call, uh, if they call and they can't get you, they're going to call our office to find uh, out. So if they national, call your office to get an update about claims, what will they? What will happen? Our national call center will be taking calls, and they're going to be uh, up and uh, running for just that reason. But not the regional offices. Um, uh, the regional offices uh, will be much reduced and. My sense is they will be uh, fully engaged in receiving and date stamping claims, and uh, uh, they won't be running a call center out of the regional offices. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, and, and thank you for what you're trying to do to make the most of a bad situation. I can only imagine that the challenges you're facing are much greater than those that you have even outlined for us here today because of this unnecessary shutdown. Thank, thank you. you. Mr. Flores. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Shinseki, for being here today. Thank you for your service to our country and to our nation's veterans. I um, want to start by giving a shout out to the Waco Regional Office. Uh, I visited with them several times over the last uh, two years, and they were making remarkable progress on, on taking care of their disability backlog, and uh, Director Limpos and the team there have done an outstanding job. Um, I, just like you, am very concerned about the impact that this shutdown could have on, on their operations and, and what could potentially have to happen to our veterans. Um, so I have a couple of questions in that regard. The first one is, uh, why is the GI Bill hotline closed when other VBA hotlines remain open? Uh, say that again. Why is the GI Bill? Why is the GI Bill hotline closed when other VBA hotlines remain open? Uh, the one hotline I uh, know will r remain open is our crisis, uh, Veterans Crisis, crisis Hotline. Uh, that is funded by the uh, Health Administration. Okay. Uh, I'm talking about the call center in Muskogee. Call center. Where? The call center in Muskogee is apparently closed. Uh, I'll go and, if uh, you permit, uh, uh, try to provide you a uh, better answer on exactly okay. which ones that, are open. That, that'll be fine. You can follow up. The, the next question is fairly simple, but it's going to take a little bit of time to give you the background so we can build up uh, to it. Uh, and it's, it goes back a, a few months, starting with uh, uh, the, the newer information that says that the White House had some uh, involvement in the IRS targeting of certain groups. Uh, and then it, it, bill, it builds from there by saying that the Park Service has said that uh, They've been told to make it as tough on Americans as possible during this shutdown period. So, again, that doesn't have anything to do with you or me right now. But uh, 
back on September the 19th, this committee held a, um, a hearing and it had uh, Assistant Secretary Joan Mooney. And I asked her a question about whether or not uh, the Office of um, Congressional Legislative Affairs had ever been influenced by the White House in terms of its responses to Congress. She replied at that time that they had not. Uh, but then she sent me a follow-up letter a few days later, and she said that sometimes that the White House does intervene on correspondence between the VA and Congress. So again, this is still setting up the background uh, for this information. And then if you go through the, the timeline of activities that we've seen recently, um, and there was a field guide that was issued on Friday, September the 27th. The VA stated that disability claims processing would not be affected. Then on September the 28th, the VA notified the House Veterans Affairs Committee that they would not be able to send uh, the November benefit checks because funding would run out in late October. You've confirmed that today. Uh, so there's nothing new there. But then on September the 30th, President Obama uh, had an interview and he stated that veterans, and I quote, veterans will find their support centers unstaffed, uh, which was a direct contradiction of the field guide that said that the vet centers would not be affected from a couple of days earlier. And then that same interview, the president also intimated that the shutdown would affect somebody in a VA office who's counseling one of her vets who's got PTSD. Uh, on October the 1st, the VA updated the field guide, or it, it was amended, to add that the end of month caveat to benefits payment uh, bullet in the original field guide. Then uh, yesterday I get the news that the Waco regional office has had to lay off a third of its staff or furlough a third of its staff. So again, this goes back to my question, which is fairly simple. And that is, did someone at the White House or the Office of Management and Budget or the Treasury or any other federal agency or any other federal employee ask you or anyone else in the Veterans Administration to modify the timetable uh, under which the VA was going to begin its operational wind down, if you will, to deal with the lapse in appropriations? Uh, fair enough. Uh, I, I think if uh, your perspective is that uh, there is the ability to uh, reach in and understand and influence how uh, we operate, uh, I, I would say uh, it's just the opposite. Now, look, we are faced with an unusual event. Uh, a shutdown of government doesn't occur uh, frequently, and we have no good plans in place. Mm -hmm. We had to go back and look at what happened in 96 to have some idea what the requirements were going to be. At the same time, we have a 13 close-up, and... Uh, you know, if on the 5th of September, whenever uh, Ms. Mooney testified, if someone had said, we're going to shut the government down, I will guarantee you between the 5th of September and 30th of September, uh, there would have been actions that I would have uh, perhaps taken differently. Uh, that didn't become obvious to us until the last week, maybe Wednesday of the last week of September. Okay. And then we had to do these assessments. And um, if your complaint is that we... Uh, uh, our Man, for just a over Let me time. reclaim my time for just a minute. I'm, I'm not complaining. I'm, I was an answering, excuse me, asking you a simple question no. uh, whether or not the White House had any influence over the timetable for the VA shutdown process. I think you've answered it no. Yeah, and, I, no. and I just want to say, the no. I'm, I mean, gla I'm glad to hear that answer. Uh, you and I both agree that um, I think that, well, let me rephrase that. I think most of us in here agree that the House has done its work by passing two appropriations bills that would deal with this issue. One is the Milcon VA bill, which would uh, fully fund the VA. We wouldn't be sitting here having this discussion today. Also, we passed HJ Res 72 last week, which would uh, fund the VA so that we wouldn't have this uh, conversation. Both those bills passed on a bipartisan basis. So I would urge uh, those folks that are listening to this hearing to uh, uh, be here to influence the, citizen, uh, the uh, Senate to take up on those two bills. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much. Ms. Brown, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. Let, let me be clear. I, I, I keep hearing the Senate, the Senate. I put the responsibility straight here with the House. We could pass a clean CR and you would not be sitting there. You, and, and I have done my entire career all I could do that veterans would not be caught up with the House and the Senate, and I don't blame the Senate, I thank God for the Senate, the bad politics of this House. And at some point, you know, let's don't confuse nobody with facts. 
Now, we're talking about November 1. I want to talk about October the 17th. If we uh, do not uh, pass uh, the full faith and credit, if we default, what will happen to all of the mothers and the spouses and the TRICARE and the checks that go out, period, for the VA? Period. Tell us what's going to happen when these people in the house let us default on our prayer. What happens to the VA? And the people that's been talking to me aren't, aren't employees. They're contractors. And the contractors are not going to get any back pay. And they're being laid off in droves because the government is not effective and the House is responsible. They could pass a clean CR for the first time ever in the history. I voted against a VA bill because it was $6 billion less than what we passed out of here. So now please respond. Well, Congresswoman, uh, I, I would just uh, uh, repeat what the president's pointed out. Uh, what he looks to the Congress to do is uh, two things. One, provide a budget so we can operate as a government, and two, pay the bills that have already been incurred. And both of those issues are at play here. Uh, I am looking for a budget, and uh, so is the rest of the government, so we can do what uh, we're charged to do. Um, and then uh, paying uh, the bills is the issue, the debt ceiling, and that are, those, those are authorizations that have already occurred. And but what happens on the 17th if we default? What happens to the VA? Will The veterans ask me, will they get their checks? Uh, Congresswoman, uh, I am planning to operate as long as I can um, uh, this month. Uh, but uh, at a certain point here in days, I'll begin to furlough people. Uh, and that'll have to do with uh, my inability to uh, continue to operate under the uh, carryover. And, uh, uh, and so whatever uh, occurs with the discussions of that ceiling, I imagine will be uh, even worse. But uh, uh, beginning here in days to weeks before the end of this month, for the most part, uh, VA will be uh, uh, reduced in operations. My office will be 90% shut down. My office, uh, the legisl legislative affairs with, with whom you deal frequently will be down to one person. Public affairs down to one person. Um, and then for the rest of our operation, other than receiving uh, claims and looking after uh, families that are uh, expecting us to uh, provide the appropriate bur burial uh, services, all of that will be reduced. So it, it, I just want to be clear. I want you to know this is a self-imposed uh, uh, disaster on the veterans and on the country. There is no need as we sit here. I mean, the, the Senate and the president had agreed to the poor levels of the House. They have agreed to it. Clean the CR and we could move forward. But yet we have people that want to blame the Senate, want to blame the president. At uh, 20 minutes to 12, we want a conference. It was over. The House is in it. And I've been in here for 22 years, and I have never seen anything like the people that serve in this House that want to act like they care about the veterans. They talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. They're out at the cemeteries or out at the memorial saying, oh, we don't know why it's shut down. Well, you voted to shut it down a few hours earlier. This is a sad state of affairs. This committee used to be bipartisan. And now you got a few members that's dragging the House of Representatives down, the people's house. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. The gentleman's time has cleared. And for the members of this committee and those that may be uh, today, the, the continuing resolution that the House actually put on the floor that has been berated uh, by a couple of members 
saying that it was less than uh, folks wanted by $6 billion was exactly the same piece of legislation that Senator Sanders filed Monday night. And so folks that are out there saying we shouldn't do this by piecemeal, Senator Sanders, along with Ms. Hirano, Mr. Begich, Mr. Tester, and Mr. Blumenthal, which coincidentally held a news conference at the very same time we've been having this hearing with the secretary, uh, to say that we should not be using him as a punching bag. Mr. Secretary, I trust that we have not used you as a punching bag today. Uh, we are trying to get the information out uh, to the veterans. And again, you, you have talked in depth about those things that we will not be able uh, to do. But my question, how, how many employees within VA will still be on the job after November 1st if uh, this shutdown continues? Yeah. Uh, again, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I uh, uh, let me take that one for the record to give you the uh, specificity that you're looking for. Um, as I say, uh, there are still factors coming together to tell me how long I operate. I've told you that the mandatory uh, funds are expected to be depleted before the end of this month, affecting both the one November checks, affecting uh, a VBA in large measure, uh, their uh, uh, present uh, workforce of about 13,000 people uh, will be r severely reduced. We'll be down to about 1,100 and roughly 1,000 people in uh, VBA. So we will have people functioning in VBA. NCA will uh, likewise have to furlough a significant portion of uh, uh, their workforce and will go to modified operations. Uh, VHA is uh, fully funded. And so when you look at the account, it'll look very large, but that's because uh, VHA is about 80% of our uh, uh, workforce and uh, our budget. Mr. But Chairman. I, but I do think it's important to remember that, you know, your total employees are about 335,000. And so when we talk about numbers of 10,000, 4,000, those are big numbers. But as it relates to the overall number uh, of 335, I would appreciate, uh, and you've already said that you would take it for the record, uh, I would appreciate you you getting that information to us. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, I, I have a, a, just a quick question for you. The chair does not recognize the gentlelady from Florida. Her time has expired. I have um, a question, Mr. Mr. Chairman, on the question that you was asking the secretary. Madam, You're asking Madam, the number of employees. My question is how many people that receive checks will not be getting those checks? I think that's a bigger question. Again, the gentlelady is not recognized for her question, uh, and I appreciate what she's asking. Uh, but, you know, I, I would, we, we knew that the possibility of this some time ago. I don't believe anybody in this room wanted to be where we are today. Do you believe the same thing, Mr. Secretary? Uh, you know, from my background, uh, I, I would say you, you look at all the options. This was not one I believe would happen. I just didn't think um, the August members of this committee uh, or the Congress would allow this to happen. So I had plans, uh, and we have quickly dusted them off and within 72 hours gone into uh, emergency procedures to continue to take care of veterans as long as we could and then uh, ensure the orderly shutdown of our activities so we're taking care of our people as well. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Chairman, if you knew you, the, the shutdown was going to happen, um, it wasn't shared with me. Yes, you always look at the possibilities. Uh, I didn't think. Uh, I just didn't think you would allow this to happen. And I think most members of this committee would say that uh, we do not want to be here. This was not an intended consequence, but we are here. Uh, and we've asked you to come in and talk to us. And, and my question, I guess, is at what point did you start doing extraordinary measures to prepare for this uh, and begin to scale back some expenditures uh, so that you would 
not be perceived as making foolish uh, expenditures of funds that may be necessary. Yeah. Uh, and you probably can gather where I'm going with this question. And, and I, no, I don't, I don't help. gather where you're going. How did, how did we end up with the $500,000 worth of art? Sure, I'd be happy to uh, answer in, that. In Kansas, why have we been spending over a million dollars in the Washington, D.C. area on PR uh, ads? Uh, again, I think those that are being furloughed want these questions asked. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's not a it's not a political question. It's a question as to prioritization, sure. because we're talking about p people not getting the benefits that they've earned, that not being able to be buried in a timely fashion. Yet we can spend uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, on things that probably the general public would think were inconsequential to taking care of our veterans. Yeah, uh, you you raised artwork. Um, and I think the suggestion that this was uh, a year-end spending, uh, that's not the case. Uh, there were three facilities that had been in uh, the process of being uh, constructed and uh, or a major uh, uh, refurbishment. In the case of uh, the Miami uh, 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 facility, uh, it's an 843,000 square foot facility, 11 floors. Uh, major renovations in this facility hadn't been done since the 1980s, and that project is completed. And part of the project was to replace wall hangings, photographs, prints that add to that environment that says uh, it's a healing environment and uh, welcoming to veterans. Uh, West uh, Los Angeles, a uh, 16,000 square foot uh, facility in which homeless and mental health clinics are uh, have been uh, provided. And then the uh, uh, Jacksonville community-based outpatient clinic, a new construction project, uh, 102,000 square feet, uh, and, and needed to be uh, outfitted. Uh, all total, about 1,400, uh, a little over 1,400 wall hangings, photographs, prints, uh, pictures of veterans, pictures of local scenery that veterans in that area would recognize. Uh, I think artwork is probably an inappropriate uh, description here. Uh, I think the average cost is under four, $400, uh, all, in, all expenses included. Uh, uh, those were part of the project and they were funded and part of the execution. Uh, you know, if there was a way to uh, have anticipated the shutdown and, and redirected some of those monies, I, I probably would have done it. But uh, uh, again, I, I, I say that it's not until the last week in September that uh, it was clear that what was going to happen uh, would happen, and uh, we went into emergency procedures. And I, I apologize for not recognizing Mr. McNerney uh, for your question. Thank you for your indulgence and your recognized. Thank you. I want to thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman uh, Miller and, and also Ranking Member Michaud for inviting me to the committee hearing and not, the other members of the committee for not objecting. It's good to be back here. It's a great committee. Uh, this is a terrible hearing, though, to, to make that happen. So um, I do uh, want to say the situation is dire. Um, on November 1st, we're going to cut off hundreds of thousands of disability uh, recipients uh, students that are depending on uh, GI Bill, families whose uh, veterans or active service members who have died. I think American public needs to know the dire situation. We're going to be sending hundreds of thousands of people into a dire strait, maybe making them homeless. Uh, and <clears throat> there's no excuse. We need to solve this problem, and we need to solve it in the next week. Um, so uh, I do have some specific questions. Uh, Mr. Secretary, in addition to Mr. Denham, my colleague uh, and uh, neighbor, I'd like to know from you about the impact of the shutdown on the French Camp uh, project. Uh, I'd like to know specifically its, pri its priority. Um, and I'll take that uh, offline. Um, now, as you know, the Veterans Service Organization's staff members, the VSO staff members, are, are, um, use the VA regional offices to help counsel veterans. Uh, but the VA, VA staff members are not members, uh, are not employees of the VA. Uh, could the VA allow them to continue to use the facilities? I understand a lot of them are shut out 
from the facilities? Can they continue to use, use those facilities uh, to help counsel our veterans? Uh, I'm told that uh, we're not allowed to do that. But uh, again, this is a day-to-day -day when we go back and uh, check to make sure that uh, the, the interpretation of the law is clear. Uh, but uh, these are some uh, pretty uh, uh, well-defined uh, rules that we operate under. Uh, the Anti-Deficiency Act has uh, provisions for um, two categories. Uh, uh, one is uh, protection of uh, life and property, and, and the other one is uh, necessary uh, implication. Well, are there any other functions that the VSOs normally perform that they're not able to perform now? Uh, we'll look for every opportunity to help them uh, uh, be successful uh, in their mission. It's uh, part of our mission as well. Uh, uh, but frankly, uh, we are trying to uh, process as many claims as we can uh, before the mandatory account is depleted. And then thereafter, we're into receiving and date stamping claims. Well, um, you 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 said, I believe, that the VA uh, processing claims are continuing. Uh, are there decisions being made about these claims? And if so, are the veterans being notified about those decisions, or is that on hold? In, in those uh, circumstances where we are uh, able to pay, and I described the retroactive. Uh, aspects of it. We won't be able to pay continuing monthly uh, uh, benefits, but for those veterans who have a date stamp that uh, goes back some time when that is awarded, we try to pay the retroactive portion of that. The m monthly cycle picks up in November. And so they'll so, be notified if the decision is made, even if they're not able to get the check? Uh, well, they'll be notified if we are able to pay the retroactive aspect of that. And then we will process the remainder of the claim and put that in, you know, in, the, uh, in the line. Uh, for students who are currently in school, I think I answered a question earlier that says that um, as long as we have mandatory uh, funds remaining, we will... Uh, honor as many of those requests as we can, but those all draw the mandatory account down and before the end of the month it will be depleted and then I will, uh, we will look to furlough uh, the workforce uh, that has been doing that. Are the prescription drug benefits uh, being impacted? Veterans prescription drug benefits? Uh, say that again, I'm sorry. Are the veterans prescription drug benefits being impacted by the shutdown? Uh, prescriptions, uh, uh, Veterans Health Administration is fully funded and so uh, uh, medications uh, are available and will be filled. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for allowing me to uh, participate today. Thank you very much, Mr. Bill. you any other questions? Mr. Kaufman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just one more uh, question, Mr. Secretary. Um, my Oversight and Investigations uh, Subcommittee uh, uncovered that the VA cybersecurity protection uh, measures were inadequate, even when the VA has been fully funded uh, before the shutdown. Uh, in fact, the investigation discovered uh, numerous occurrences when foreign state-sponsored hackers uh, infiltrated the VA network. Uh, has a, um, how has the shutdown affected the private information of veterans and their families, are these 20 million individuals in the VA system now at even greater risk? Uh, uh, Congressman, I uh, will tell you that of uh, what we know, we have, uh, uh, we will have the ability to respond to what we know, but there's, you know, as you would uh, expect, uh, more to this than uh, sometimes even uh, we're able uh, to know. So we, uh, we do uh, take steps to assure the security of our system. Um, every event uh, better prepares us for the next, and we are active here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Michaud. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a quick uh, follow-up question, Mr. Secretary. You mentioned about, about the delays and the overtime you already had in, in the original budget you presented to Congress, as well as uh, anticipating, uh, for, I think it was $40 million to carry over for, for next year's budget. 
Uh, since uh, you've u utilized that uh, $40 million, you can't carry it over. And since the delays have caused uh, the backlog to creep back up again, uh, will you be requesting an additional supplemental to deal with replacing that $40 million as well as more overtime money to get you back where you have to be as far as the backlog? Uh, I think uh, the basic question is, uh, am I going to try to reconstitute that $40 million? Uh, I will find every way I can internal my accounts, and if I I'm not able to do that, and uh, and, uh, and and I need to look for uh, support here to get uh, uh, that funding in place to uh, be able to get veterans the care they need. Uh, I, I will seek it. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hughes Camp. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I do want to take a, a note, a uh, little bit of time. I'd like to apologize to anybody in this committee that might have been offended. Uh, by my trying to uh, uh, find out exactly why the U.S. Senate has not uh, voted on these appropriations. I do appreciate the bipartisan nature of this committee, but I think we all agree here that our veterans should not be used as pawns in uh, this particular debate, and I appreciate the, the work uh, in, in terms of the secretary. Uh, but the, the language that, that there is reference to the, uh, the individual in the Senate that I asked a question about uh, has used some, some language that I don't think anybody in this committee has used. Uh, has not called anybody an anarchist or a fanatic or insane. That's the language we hear coming out of here, and it does no service to our veterans. So I apologize if any took offense at uh, trying to figure out why we uh, have not uh, seen a vote in that. I would appreciate the uh, secretary continuing to try to work with uh, with uh, the Senate, encourage them to bring that to a vote. I'm pretty confident, based on what we hear here, that uh, that can go right to the, the Senate and keep your doors open, or to the president, keep those doors open. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Hughes Camp. We've uh, Ask the other members if they have any. Uh, Mr. Ruiz, do you have a question? Sorry, Mr. Secretary. We... <laughs> Mr. Ruiz, you're recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, uh, Secretary Shinseki. Thank you for your service to our country. The government shutdown has caused a crisis that could have been avoided had Congress simply worked together to put people ahead of politics and solutions above ideology. It is unconscionable that Congress continues to put political gamemanship above the needs of our veterans. The best way to help veterans in my district and across the country is to end this reckless shutdown. Now that the VA is required to furlough thousands of employees, how will that affect the veterans claims backlog and constituents specifically in my district, meaning how will furloughs impact the LA regional office and the San Diego regional office, which review claims for veterans in my district? Uh, Congressman, uh, as I uh, indicated earlier, uh, we, uh, our availability of carryover funding for 2013, roughly $40 million, uh, we exhausted that on 7 October and uh, then had to furlough about 7,800 people. Uh, we have about 13,000 uh, regional uh, benefits uh, employees who are doing what they always do and that's you know, process claims as uh, quickly and as accurately as, as they can. Uh, with the end of mandatory overtime, we are doing that at 1,400 uh, claims each day less than we were doing, uh, you know, before 30 September. So there's a cumulative effect here. Um, uh, these uh, employees uh, will continue to work until such time as something we call the mandatory account that currently has some residual funds in. Uh, they will continue to process claims until that point and where we can pay for retroactive, uh, a retroactive claim or for a student claim, we will continue to do that. But as we do that, we draw down the mandatory account. When the man mandatory account is exhausted before the end of this month, then uh, the vast majority of these uh, people will also be uh, uh, furloughed. And uh, that will begin uh, to have a great impact on the, the backlog today. The backlog is already 2,000 higher than it was 
on 30 September. So it's already beginning to have an effect. Well, I want you to know that we will continue, I will continue to advocate for a pragmatic solutions so that we can open our doors specifically for our veterans. Uh, my office in the district has not shut down. We have extended hours and we're even working weekends if a veteran needs it to come and, and uh, pick up that mantle uh, because uh, the mantle that has been dropped by this ridiculous uh, shutdown. And we will be there for our veterans and I look forward to collaborating with you so that once we open our doors, those uh, veterans that have been uh, uh, ill affected by this will have expedited uh, prioritized treatment so that we can continue to serve the veterans to the best of our abilities. Yeah. So I appreciate your service to our country and thank you thank very much. Thank you. That's my intent as well, Congressman. Thank you. I yield thank, back my Thank time. you, Mr. Ruiz. I'd like to recognize uh, for a final question, Ms. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Chairman, I would like, before I ask my question, uh, the four service organizations uh, sent a letter to Congress not supporting the piecemeal uh, VA uh, bill on the floor. And so may, is, is it possible that I could submit that to the record? Without objection. Thank you. Uh, now, Mr. Uh, because, you know, to talk about what a senator introduced, uh, I don't want to talk about the Senate. I want to talk about the House the House of Representatives where I serve. And Mr. Secretary, my question to you is come November or the third week in October, will 3.8 million veterans not get their checks in the mail? Benefits, that's a nice thing, but checks is what they live on. Most veterans that get those checks are on fixed income. Explain to me how they're supposed to make it. Uh, Congresswoman, uh, effective 1 November, if uh, uh, we don't resolve this, uh, those veterans will not receive pension compensation uh, for uh, veterans who are in school, their education uh, uh, checks, um, uh, vocational rehab, and uh, those beneficiaries are not just veterans. That's three million veterans. But when you add uh, surviving uh, spouses and children, um, you know, it's over five million uh, individuals who will be involved. I mean, this is uh, serious. And I'm hoping that uh, the leadership of uh, this committee uh, will help us resolve it. And thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, you know, I was told that um, the House um, somebody fed them some snake oil. So I went home and tried to find snake oil. I think it's just in Texas. So I did look for some holy oil and I did bring some back. But this is not a joke. This is very serious. Veterans have come up to me in church Sunday because that's the only place I went Sunday, two services and I needed more. And they wanted to know about their benefits. And I told them as of October the 17th, if we default, they will not get their benefits. And I told the Social Security people the same thing. It, you know, is this true? Will they not get their benefits? Is this a game? Uh, that's not a game, Congresswoman. There are uh, veterans and uh, service members, uh, families, uh, children counting on us. And uh, they expect us to deliver. Well. Five million of them will be uh, impacted here severely. I hope there there is some leadership on this committee that will work with the leadership in the House and come up with a clean, continuing resolution because the problem that we have is that so many of the people that's been furloughed, um, th they're contract people. They will not get back pay. And mo uh, many of them are veterans. Do you all have contracted employees also? Uh, we do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentle lady. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here again on short notice and for over two and a half hours. We appreciate you taking the questions. We do have other questions that we'll submit to you for the record. And in, in, in particular, 
uh, I want to ask that you help this committee in furthering a bill that was passed out of this committee in a 100% bipartisan fashion. That is advanced funding for the remainder of VA's budget so that we don't get into this type of situation anymore. All members will have five legislative days with which to revise and send their remarks. Mr. Secretary, thank you. This hearing is adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Sorry you're in this position. How are you doing, man? I know. I have to hurry to get here. Thank you. Sorry. No, no, no. No, I'll, 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 I'll talk to him later on. Thank you.